Builder design pattern is a useful one when you need to create uh, instances of, let's say, model objects or any other types of objects, but mo model objects most commonly uh, over either period of time, sort of when you're collecting um, data and properties and values needed to create those objects over time, let's say in a user form, or when you need when you have subclasses and more concrete types of objects that you want to create, but sort of there is an algorithm or depending on the data collected, you will uh, you would want to produce different types of data. So or different types of objects, right? Different um, classes of different types. So like, if you want to get a uh, overall overview of uh, builder design pattern, I highly recommend go go into this uh, website, uh, refactoring.guru uh, des slash design patterns uh, builder. So it has a really good overview of sort of what a design a builder design pattern is in general and uh, sort of how it looks with UML diagrams and then um, they have some uh, pseudocode examples with something sort of looking like Python, which is pretty straightforward and would be mm, uh, clear to any objective-oriented uh, developer. But um, today I will show you how um, how would you implement a builder uh, design pattern in Swift. Um, uh, and how useful it could be in a hypothetical um, sort of iOS application, uh, focusing specifically around creating instances of um, model objects and having a builder that uh, helps in the production code to, um, to build those model objects and then having a mock builder in your unit tests that will help produce help you produce uh, mock uh, uh, model objects for mocks. Builder design pattern actually could be implemented in various ways and with various degrees of complexity. And again, it, it will depend greatly on whether you have different types of uh, classes and subclasses that you can produce and want to produce using builder pattern. Uh, I'll show you something slightly more sort of simpler, uh, but it might uh, grow as I kind of develop it with you guys. So uh, we'll see where it gets us. Uh, we'll start with defining sort of our hypothetical example. Let's say in our system, in our domain, we're dealing with some sort of inventory management and there are parts in our application, right? Something representing maybe parts of machinery or parts of a car that you assemble or, or something like that, right? And let's Basically, let's assume that we have uh, a. Let's assume that we have a part model, and it might have various types of properties. For simplicity's sake, we'll just go for let's say three properties. It's going to be ID, name, and uh, uh, quantity. Right, the number of um, uh, uh, number of units of that part that we have, and um, we can define this as a class or as a struct. So for now, for simplicity's sake, let's go with a struct. It will give us a um, uh, will give us initializer by default implemented, um, and this is supposed to be int. So yeah. So let's say um, we have we have this type of model object, right? This struct. The way w you would uh, uh, approach this uh, sort of the way you would build uh, you would create a builder pattern, f a builder object for this is uh, you would have you would define a part builder. And uh, you def you basically what what we would need is sort of two things. You would need to collect somehow collect throughout the life cycle of this part builder 
you would need to collect all the properties that this part would need to be instantiated. So in our case, just three, right? But it could grow and would ma map one to one. Um, uh, if you have more things and more properties in your model object than your part, right? So in our case, again, for the sake of example, it's just these three. So notice what we're already doing here differently, or sort of something that you might not expect. Uh, unlike with a part model object, where everything is declared, all the properties are declared as uh, non-optional let properties, uh, here we're actually defining them as var properties, meaning they're variables they can change, and we're actually setting them as optionals, right? And uh, later, Every builder object, that's the how uh, design pattern uh, works, how it's supposed to be implemented. You have a build function that you call. Uh, it could be named something else, right? But it should be maybe like make or create. But uh, it should be pretty clear and obvious that this is the method to call to produce that type of model, that model object that this builder is building, right? And it will only, in this case, it returns an optional, uh, it could, it's an optional object that it returns because we could have all the variables that we need and all the properties that we need and all the data to create that part model, or we might not. And in this case, we would return nil. In sort of a real world application, you probably, you could go with this. This is fine. It's um, acceptable, right? Because you'll just have to, if, check if let unwrap or something like that or check with a guard or just an if statement whether the part was created or not when you use wherever you use the builder um, but you might consider uh, creating throwing errors here uh, and creating specific errors when you don't have one one or another property that you need in this from this list to create part object unless of course some of the properties here such as name are optional as well right then it doesn't matter whether you collected the data here or not in the builder you would um, um, you, you can use it and yeah and the way this is sort of the simplistic implementation of this the way it would work somewhere in UI view controller or wherever we would uh, call or you know when you get data from the backend, or when maybe when you're collecting it from the user in the UI, uh, you would instantiate your builder, and then you would um, start setting the values and getting data in. And as soon as you got all the data, to in order to obviously in order to uh, create a part, you would need to uh, call the build method. This is how you would uh, use it, right? The So the advantages that you already have with this approach are, you could, first of all, you could already use this uh, builder in two scenarios. Let's say you're fetching part objects from the backend and then you mapping them onto your domain model objects or your domain model structs, right? Then you could use part builder to collect and map all the data that you need onto this and maybe do some validation and checks and stuff as I was mentioning before through throw and errors or whatnot on whether everything was collected or not and then you know immediately call and uh, build method in that mapper and produce the parts and maybe flat map on on the nil, nil what, those that were nil to get rid of optionality and get rid of the stuff that wasn't created and here we go. You got you got that right, um, but a big use case where you also could be using it, and this is where it's quite commonly um, uh, utilized. This design pattern. Let's say, imagine your users can create part instances of part models in the application's UI itself. Right, you're collecting. There is a form that the user fills with a bunch of fields, in this case, probably for name and quantity, and ID uh, might not be there, or you set some default or even set nil or um, empty string or something like that until it's provided from by the backend. But regardless, 
uh, you what you could be using there instead of trying to create part object or having something else instead of it uh, or keeping everything in memory in your view controllers or view models or whatever you have while the user is entering data, you could utilize builder, ob builder object for that, right? You could have an instance of your part builder somewhere in your where, where your form is, right, while you're collecting data. And as the user types it in, in your text fields or whatever you have, you can fill in those variables here, right, in, in the part builder and then report back to the user if something's missing or when they hit submit and everything is there, you call your build method just like here, right? And then when you if the part object is created, you can go ahead and maybe here uh, send it to the backend, right? So here, again, that's already even more useful, right? There's a different use case for it. But it gets even better and even more handy when you get to unit testing your code. And you, I, I bet if uh, th there's like 100% chance in your application if your parts objects are the main model objects that are used throughout your system in your unit tests, you would need to mock and fake them and stop them uh, to substitute the actual stuff that comes from the backend, right? Or to um, set the environment of your system such that you can, well, run your unit tests and test various each edge cases. So in this case, instead of directly every time creating your part object and supplying all the uh, properties that it needs to be instantiated, you could actually have a uh, mock part builder, right? That implements basically exactly the same API and behaves exactly the same way, right? Or instead you can even, you can use the actual part builder itself, right? Because tech, like so technically, uh, if you implement this design pattern properly, you it's supposed to be dumb enough to just collect the data and produce the model, ob or produce the objects, right? Nothing else. The advantage of having a mock part builder and maybe even uh, subclassing it, subclassing your uh, part builder from your production code in your um, in your um, unit test code is that you could then attach and overload things with more behavior. So for example, you might be... Uh, you might be doing this in your unit tests. You would want to create every time you create model objects, you probably want to simulate backend's behavior, meaning uh, most likely backend returns a collection, let's say backend returns a collection of part objects to you upon uh, fetching, fetching data. Um, all of those objects are not going to have the same ID, right? They're going to have a unique UUID, unique identifier. Most of the backend systems they, these days, especially if they use relational database under the hood, would have that, which means in your unit test, you'll need to simulate it. And I, what I've seen a lot of people do is to like increment manually this ID number in the unit tests and write tons of duplicated code. So instead, if you have a mock part builder, you can actually have a counter that counts the number of instances that was produced by that builder and then automatically uses that number to increment the ID to make it unique of the variables of the objects that you produce with that builder. So you have IDs counter and then when you uh, overload your build method, uh, right before doing that, you would uh, inc increment your ID's counter and then set your ID property inside of this mock part builder because it will have one because it's subclassing from the part builder. You would set your ID. Uh, you would set your ID to that ID's counter incremented and then produce uh, new instances with it, right? Uh, and this way, again, as I was mentioning before, uh, it's, you will have uh, 
unique IDs for all of your instances in the tests in, in your mock instances. And you can do even more. This is a little bit breaking the pattern, but you could actually overload your uh, mock parts builder and add more methods to it, such as uh, convenience methods to initialize uh, your objects or build your objects with pre-filled data. And in this example, we actually don't have uh, much here, but maybe like one of the examples could be uh, you would want to create a part that is out of stock. An out of stock part means the one that has zero quantity or even negative, right, for, for some reason. So you could do this. Uh, you, you would uh, set the quantity and then to zero or whatever negative number if you need it, and then uh, utilize the same method that will increment the counter and return uh, the instance of that part uh, object uh, the same way. This is getting, uh, this is technically breaking the pattern and kind of combining two patterns together. This is uh, more of a factory uh, design pattern, not fact, well, factory method or factory object rather. Uh, so this is again, a little bit bending the rules, but I've seen this be used and, uh, kind of being very handy and convenient, but to finish this fully and properly, um, sort of come to complete this, uh, implementation, we actually would want to, um, finish with setting the protocol for this so that part builder and mock part builder both um, both implement the same protocol of part builders. So this way now uh, you could either stick with the inheritance and do it through subclassing and have uh, part or just a part builder that you use in the production code implement that this protocol and then the mock builder subclass it or if you don't want to stick with inheritance and want to go for different, combine it with a different design pattern, pattern let's say uh, a decorator, you could do it that way uh, where you would implement, sort of have a mock part builder that also implements this part builder interface, but it will wrap around an actual part builder and then utilize it and then overload and override and add things to the methods where you, you kind of want to change the behavior, right? It's a bit more sort of a boilerplate code in order to do that, uh, but it's an option if you're not sticking with inheritance or kind of don't want to go that route. So let's, let's implement that. So yeah, this is how would you wrap it around, right? So we, we have the property uh, that we're decorating, which is the part builder, could be the original part builder. And then um, and then we're delegating every method or every mm, computed property in this case and this method to it. But since we're doing this delegation, we can actually do some work uh, prior or after, right? And let's say we want to implement the same thing where we uh, increment the ID counters, right? So we can do exactly the same. Uh, keep a property here in this object in this decorator mock. Increment the counter in the build method. Set the ID and then call call build method on the decorated property. And this is exactly the same way if we want to have some helper methods, some factories there, we can also attach them uh, but yeah, and in this case, the exactly the same thing would work, but again, ultimately it is delegated to decorated part builder, uh, instance. So yeah, guys, uh, this is how you would implement design, uh, builder pattern, builder design pattern in Swift and iOS. And, uh, we talked about the use cases for it. There are more other design patterns that are very useful for iOS developers and can be utilized um, in iOS code bases. And uh, stay tuned, I'll cover more, more of them in future videos.